Hi, folks. We are very happy to have you all here um, to begin the CPAS uh, Discovery Seminar today. I would like to introduce you to the CPAS Deputy Director, Cindy Breer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dawn. Uh, yes, we are very, very um, delighted to be back. Um, welcome everybody to, um, to our CPAS Discovery Seminar Series. We started this series to share with the public, um, UCAR, NCAR community, and our many colleagues um, at universities and across the globe, the impressive breadth and depth of the research that is being done by our CPAS scientists that study the entire Earth system science. Our scientists studies everything from exploring the depths of the ocean, flying into hurricanes to take measurements, um, heliophysics research, and scientists that study uh, um, the mysteries of the Arctic. I do want to orientate you. Um, you will see on your screen that there will be a Slido um, for your questions that you can pose during the um, seminar. Um, we are going to hold all the questions for the seminar till after um, the seminar is concluded and then it will post it on the screen. Um, so please use the Slido during the, uh, the talk to post your um, questions for Leeway. So with that, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Leeway Jiha, who is a UCAR CPAS project scientist with the NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, GFDL. Li Wei received her PhD in climate dynamics from the George Mason University, and her research interests include climate predictability and predictions on seasonal to decadal um, timescales. She's also interested in climate extremes, climate change detection, and attribution. The skill for prediction of temperature extremes on seasonal scales is really beneficial for a number of sectors. And a recent study has shown that the frequency of the North American summertime hot days and wintertime cold days can skillfully be predicted a couple of months in advance with the newly developed GFDL seamless system for prediction and earth system research or SPEAR um, seasonal forecasting system. Li Wei will today delve into this subject a little bit more and she'll speak on seasonal prediction of temperature extremes in the GFDL seasonal forecast system. So please join me in a welcoming Li Wei. Li Wei, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Cindy, for the introduction. Actually, it's my great honor to give a seminar today at UCAR. Uh, as said, my talk today is on the seasonal prediction of North American temperature extremes in the GFDL SPEAR seasonal forecast system. SPEAR uh, seasonal forecast system makes a real-time seasonal forecast every month that contributing to the North American multimodal ensemble program. So here we are looking at the Mm, prediction skills of uh, temperature extremes in SPEAR system. Uh, actually, this work is, uh, I collaborated with uh, many of my colleagues at uh, GFDL and uh, Princeton University. So the motivation of this study is really because of the high impact of temperature extremes, both in the winter season cold extremes and the summer heat extremes. Showing here in the middle is the temperature map for the 2021 February. There was a cold extreme last year, February, in central United States. And uh, even in Texas, there was uh, snowstorms. It caused lots of uh, troubles in like transportation, and the power system. Also, uh, at least uh, more than 200 people died because of the cold extremes. Not only in the cold, uh, cold not in, in the winter season, the cold extreme, 
In summer season, the heat waves, heat extremes also has large impact on human health and as well as like uh, resource management. So the scientific questions here we ask uh, the followings. First, we want to know if such extremes are predictable. If they are predictable, how long they can be predicted? Uh, another important question is, what are the predictability sources of temperature extremes, both in summer and uh, winter seasons? In other words, why they are predictable? Looking at the literature, we see early studies on the temperature extreme predictions are mostly on synoptic to sub-seasonal time scales. We can see lots of uh, documentations on those studies. Well, in contrast, uh, there are only few studies on the prediction of uh, temperature extremes on seasonal and uh, longer time scales because it's uh, really challenging to predict extremes on uh, like seasonal and beyond the seasonal time scales. So that's the focus of uh, my study. So we want to know if the uh, temperature extremes on seasonal scales are predictable or not. Here I see uh, extremes is not uh, a single extreme, actually it's a, a statistics of extreme events in the season. Here shows how we define the temperature extremes on seasonal time scales. Um, so here, because there are various ways to, to define extremes, here we use a um, definition that uh, consider the PDF of uh, temperature distribution. For example, when we define the winter cold extremes, we look at the temperature distributions of the season. In the winter season, if a day D is defined as a cold day when it's daily maximum temperature anomaly less than the 10 percentile of that day's maximum temperature anomaly distribution. That's the climatological distribution based on the historical period from 1991 to 2019. So looking at this figure, um, the, if the daily maximum temperature below this 10% threshold is called a cold day. So based on this threshold, we can look at each day of the season in the winter season, which is DGF for North America. So if it's a cold day, we sum them together for the entire season, then divide by the number of days in the season, then we get a frequency of cold days in the winter season. So we really study the frequency of extremes in the entire season. And uh, here shows an example of how we calculate the, the uh, frequency of extremes. The lines shows the maximum temperature anomaly uh, in the DGF season is day one to day 90. So the red line shows the 10% 10 percent, 10 percentile threshold. Any temperature anomalies below this line is called a cold day. So we add them together, divide by 90, we get the so-called the TX10P. We, that's the, our index. Uh, similarly for the su uh, summer season heat extreme, we define the TX90P based on the 90th percentile uh, temperature, uh, temperature threshold. It's similar as uh, the definition of cold extremes, except that for the heat extremes, we use constant threshold because we see the threshold actually doesn't vary 
um, much in the entire season. That's why we use the constant threshold. And the model here, we use the sphere uh, model. Sphere is a coupled climate model having the atmosphere, land, ocean, and sea ice components. And we conducted a series of reef forecast experiment. So the ocean initial conditions for the reef forecast are from the ocean data simulation. And the atmosphere, land, and sea ice initial conditions are from the severe restoring experiments. We, in the restoring experiments, we used uh, CFSR and OIST uh, restore the temperature, moisture, and uh, winds to those uh, observed or real analysis data. So with that, we initialize the model every month on the first day of each month and forecast the 12 months. And for each initial conditions, we have 15 ensemble members. And these experiments are done from 1992 to 2019. We look at the least 28 years of period of data in this study. The verification data we used are mostly from ERA5, including SST, G potential height, soil moisture, temperature, etc. And we also used a couple of observed climate indices, including Nino 4 in index, PDO, AM1, PNA. First, we look at the North American summer heat extremes. Showing here is the correlation scale of summer heat extreme at lead zero, three, six, nine months. It's the correlation scale at each grade point. Here, the lead zero months forecast means we forecast the JJA temperature extreme that based on, uh, initial, based on the forecast initialized on June 1st is called lead zero. So for the lead zero months forecast, we see the temperature extremes are uh, showing high correlation scale um, over most of the United States. And when the lead time increases, the scale decreases. And uh, similar for the longer lead time, However, at least nine months, we still see some significant correlation scale in some areas of the United States. So we see the, the summer uh, heat extremes on local scale is, uh, show, is uh, it, it showing scale, uh, correlation scale on local scales. And next, we look at the correlation scale of summer mean temperature at different lead times. Because early studies have shown that the extreme temperature is correlated with mean temperature. Here we see, want to see how this relationship shows up in the sphere forecast system. Um, here shows the a correlation scale of JJA mean two meter temperature. It has much higher scale than the scale of extremes. And similarly for other lead times compared to the scale of extremes. And we also see the uh, scale pattern are also uh, similar to the scale pattern of extremes. And next time we, we see the correlation between the extreme temperature and the mean temperature in summer season. In both observations and the sphere model handcasts, we see they are highly correlated nearly everywhere over North America. And same thing in model handcast. 
So we, are, we see the extreme temperature and the mean summer temperature are correlated with a high lake scale in severe handcast system. So having we uh, diagnosed the scale of extreme temperature, next we want to know if there is a large scale predictable components uh, of temperature extremes that can show skillful scale, skillful can be skillful, predictable, unseasonal time scales. Therefore, we use the uh, method called average predictable um, predictability time. So this method uh, can maximize predictability, which is defined as signal to total ratio that can uh, diagnose uh, predictable components. It's similar like the EOF analysis, but uh, instead of maximizing variance, here the APT analysis maximizing predictability because we want to know the predictability of extremes. So using the, the APT analysis, we decompose the extremes uh, and find the three predictable components that are skillful, predictable, unseasonal time scales. Here, uh, we show the spatial pattern, time series, and uh, correlation scale of these three predictable components. For the first one, we see the positive anomalies everywhere over North America. And it's a time series showing an increasing trend. And the time series, the, the scale shows a significant correlation scale from lead zero to lead nine months. It's nearly constant for the correlation scale. So this component means the heat extremes increases with time in the historical period and is predictable for nine months. For the second component, we see the largest magnitudes over Central North, North America. And the time series shows uh, interannual to decadal uh, variability. The correlation scale also shows significant correlation uh, at least for nine months. As for the third predictable component, we see a structure, um, dipole structure, with uh, cold over uh, northwest and uh, warm over southeast. And the time series showing interannual variability also. The scale shows. Uh, Predict, significant predictable at four months lead. So as we have uh, identified the predictable components, the next question we want to address is why they are predictable. So what provides the prediction skill for these uh, components? We look at for each component separately. For the first one, because we see the time series increases with time and it shows positive everywhere uh, in the North America, we suspect it's related to climate change. That's why we calculate the externally forced component of temperature extremes in summer season from the severe historical simulation. This is the pattern we diagnosed from signal to noise maximizing EOF analysis. The pattern also shows a positive over the entire United States uh, and North Canada, North America. And the time series of this uh, pattern, the red line here, shows increasing trend. 
and it's corresponding to the time series of the first predictable component as shown in the black line and the blue line. So we conclude that the first predictable component is mostly the response to external forcing. Then we look at the second and the third predictable component in both the observations and the model handcast. Let's look at the first component. We use the time series of the second component and correlated with global SST, both in observation and model. Based on the SAT pattern here, we see significant correlation over North Pacific. It's like a negative PDO phase. And also see some correlations over North Atlantic. In fact, uh, if we correlated the, the time series of this component with the AMO index, they are significantly correlated, also significantly correlated with the PDO index. We think they are related to PDO and AMO. In the model handcast, we see similar structure in North, Amer North, North Pacific Ocean and a little bit over North Atlantic is not as significant as in the observations. And for the third component, we also correlated with global SAT. Here shows the largest correlation over tropical Pacific. It's like a La Nina-like pattern also show the La Nina-like pattern of in the model handcast. Therefore, we think the, the third predictable component is ENSO related. Because we know the uh, SSTs are much more predictable than atmospheric variables. We think the high prediction scale of SSTs in the ocean provides prediction skill of temperature extremes over the North American continent. Here I just show you an example of how predictable the SST is in sphere handcast system. The show here shows the correlation skill of the PDO index in sphere for the initial month from January to December and the target months from uh, lead zero season to lead nine season. We see the, C the PDO index is highly predictable for all the initial months and target months, except for these two months. So mostly it's predictable at least for nine months in the seasonal forecast system. So we think the skillful prediction of SSTs in the sphere serve as the source of prediction skill of North American summer heat extremes. And because the heat extremes are also related to dry conditions in the summer season, and early studies also has found that land conditions are related to the heat extremes. So we correlated the predictable component time series with the soil moisture anomalies in both observations and the model handcast. For the second predictable component, we see the largest negative correlation over central of North America, which is similar to the first, the second predictable pattern, which also shows largest uh, loadings over central North America. A similar pattern is shown in model. And for the third predictable component, 
we see the dipole structure with uh, these white anomalies over northwest and uh, uh, positive, positive negative anomalies over southeast. And the same in the model hand cast, similar to the pattern of the third predictable component. So from these results, we think the land conditions, in other words, the land atmosphere feedbacks also contribute to the prediction scale of summer heat extremes in North America. Here we show the reconstructed prediction skill uh, from the three predictable components we showed earlier. So using only the three predictable component to reconstruct the predictions, we can filter out the unpredictable components. So um, we expect the it should has higher prediction skill in the reconstructed prediction. And we compare the skill with the raw prediction skill that without any filtering. And we see the difference, the reconstructed skill is higher in some areas of North America, in, also in Alaska. So this is average over all the lead times. We also look at each individual lead times. The right line shows the percentile of area with significant correlation scale is higher than the raw forecast scale as shown in the blue line. Almost every lead time except the first one. So this uh verify our hypothesis that uh, reconstruction using pre predictable components improves forecast skill. And next, uh, we are going to show similar uh, analysis, but uh, focus on the North American wintertime cold extremes. And here shows the correlation scale of winter season cold extremes at four different lead times from lead zero to five and nine months. You see the for lead zero over the high latitudes, there are significantly correlation scale. But at lead two months and the scale Reduce, reduce it significantly. At least five and nine months, it only has a very limited scale over high latitudes. We'll show later that this is mostly from external forcing. Anyway, the winter extreme is not as predictable as heat extreme, but it does show some prediction scale. I, as some areas. Also, we show the scale of cold extremes that's related to the, the mean temperature extremes, uh, mean temperature scale. On the axis shows the scale of two meter temperature and the y axis shows the scale of extreme temperature. If the values uh, below this diagonal line is uh, explained as the mean temperature scale is higher than the extreme temperature scale. So we see the center is below the diagonal line. So the mean temperature scale is higher than the extreme temperature scale. And uh, we see they are highly correlated with the correlation coefficient of 0.72. Therefore, the mean uh, temperature scale and the extreme temperature scale in winter season are also highly correlated. 
Similarly, for the cold extremes, we diagnosed three predictable modes that shows skillful skill on seasonal time scales. The first one uh, shows um, negative, uh, uh, negative anomalies uh, over most of North America. And the time series uh, showing an uh, upward trend, which means the cold extremes decreases with time in this period. And the correlation scale shows uh, significantly for nine months. The second component shows the this, uh, uh, positive anomaly over the Southern United States and uh, Mexico and negative anomaly over uh, Northwestern of North America. And the uh, scale shows it's predictable for two months. And for the third predictable component, the largest magnitudes are in mid to high latitudes here. It shows large positive uh, anomalies and it's only predictable at least zero months which means the DJF winter cold extreme is predictable uh, on December 1st, at least zero. And here we correlated the, the oh, by the way, the, we, next we wanna explore the predictability sources. For the first one, is uh, we see the trend and uh, this pattern we think is also related to the climate change. Here I'm not showing the figure if we plot the linear trend pattern or the you can diagnose the external force the pattern use other method. It shows a similar pattern as this mode. So we think the first mode is related to external relative forcing. For the second component, we correlated with global SST. It shows a La Nino, uh, El Nino-like pattern over Central uh, Pacific. In the model handcard, it also shows a El Nino-like pattern here. So this is the statistical relationship we diagnosed. Next, we want to confirm this relationship between El Nino and the winter cold extreme in model sensitivity experiments. So we uh, conducted a pair of AMAP-like AMAP style simulations with SPEAR. The first experiment is the same as SPEAR control simulations, except that we forced the model with uh, observed climatological SIT all over the globe. And the second, component, the second uh, experiment, we did the same thing, but we add the Nino 4 SIT anomalies on top of the climatological SIT. This Nino 4 SIT anomalies is added to the tropical Pacific from 20 degree south to 20 degree north. So we see the only difference is because of the Nino 4 SIT anomalies. So the results, uh, the any difference uh, between these two experiments is due to the influence uh, from Nino 4. SSC anomalies. Let's look at the results from the AMAP style uh, sensitivity experiments. Uh, here we showed the extreme difference between the two sensitivity experiments. We see the structure shows the dipole structure, uh, the 
cold extremes over southeast southeast of United States and uh, uh, negative anomalies over northwestern of North America. So this is really uh, close to the pattern of the uh, second component of cold extremes. And looking at the regression map of 500 millibar height, we see the, the wave-like pattern here. The high pressure system over the least part contribute to the warm anomalies here. And the low pressure system over southeastern North American contribute to the cold extremes over here. And we compare the, these um, the model results with the observed the composite of cold extremes that relevant to the Nino 4 SST anomalies. We see some similarities between these two, and but some differences are also seen here over northeastern of North America. So in the observed composite with Nino 4, we see largest uh, negative anomalies over here, but not in the model. But the cold anomalies, cold uh, extremes are similar to the model simulations. And uh, from the circulation pattern, we see the high pressure system is also corresponding well with the warming here and the low pressure system corresponding to some cold extremes here. Even though we see some differences between the circulations also in the model and observations, we see the least in the model, this high pressure system shifted westward compared to the composite from observations. Well, anyway, in the sensitivity studies, we show that the relationship between uh, ENSO and the winter cold extremes. The last one, we shows the uh, correlation between the third predictable component time series with the snow cover in observation and the model. So we see in the observations, we see positive uh, correlations over mid to high latitudes. And uh, in model hand cast, it shows uh, positive correlation over Eastern part, but not as much as in the central or and Northwestern United States as in the observations. We think a part of the reason might be because of the different variables we use in model and uh, observations because of the uh, availability of the data. And looking at the circulations, in the observation, we see the high pressure system over North Pacific, the Aleutian area, and the low pressure system over northeastern of North American continent. So this low pressure system correspond to the this high snow cover here because the this uh, polar cold air can uh, transport to the mid to high latitude of North American continent which corresponding to more snow covers and more cold extremes here. Same thing in the model handcast, we see the high pressure over North Pacific and low pressure over North and North America. Therefore, we conclude the third component is related to the winter uh, snow anomalies over mid to high latitudes. Here for the cold extremes, we also compare the, is the reconstructed scale with the raw model forecast scale. 
we see the difference showing here over parts of the Canada as average over all lead times. For each individual lead time, we measure as the area with significant scale. The reconstructed showing higher for lead one month to lead nine months. For lead zero, we know that the initial conditions uh, dominate. That's why the reconstructed is not as uh, skillful as the raw prediction skill. Well, overall, it shows higher in improved skill in the reconstructed uh, predictions. This has implications uh, in the uh, prediction that we can use the predictable components to make predictions, which can improve our prediction skill of cold extremes. Here is the summary that in this study, we identified uh, three predictable components of summer heat extremes and the winter cold extremes. These components are skillfully predictable on seasonal time scales. And for the summer heat extremes, the external forcing and the SST anomalies over North Pacific and Central Pacific and the AMO and soil moisture, uh, the predictability sources. And for the wintertime cold extremes, we think the climate change and Central Pacific SST anomalies, as well as the snow anomalies in mid to high latitudes contribute to the prediction scale of North American cold extremes. We also understand there are limitations of this study. Here we show the results from our sphere handcasts that it's possible that these results can be uh, model dependent, can be different in uh, other forecast system or other independent data. And we uh, have shown that the potential predictability sources as SST related forcing and land conditions but we know we, we don't in include other sources of predictability. So in other words, other, um, other variability or, or such as stress fear or other um, variability can also contribute to the uh, prediction scale of extremes. With that, uh, so I thank you very much for your attention and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jia. It, these are really exciting improvements in uh, seasonal predictions. Um, that was really great information. We truly appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, now, as everyone could see, uh, this is a question and answer portion of today's seminar. If you have any kind of a question that you would like um, like to ask, please please uh, do so now. And uh, while you guys are thinking of some questions, um, I would just like to invite you all to attend our next seminar on Wednesday, November 23rd with Dr. Wen Ho Dong, uh, CPAS project scientist at NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. He will be speaking on uh, simulation of United States mesoscale convective systems using GFDL's new high resolution general circulation model. Um, and we, it looks like we do have a question. Um, please add more. Um, so, uh, so Leeway, are there any other data variables or observations that you would like to include in this model to further enhance uh, prediction? Uh, actually, this is a good question. 
uh, as uh, we said in the last slide, that there's uh, limitations of this study. So there could be other predictability sources that can provide the prediction skill uh, that we haven't seen or haven't found in the uh, spear handcuff forecast system. Some of the reason might be because of uh, the model's ability to represent the relationship between the sor so predictability source and uh, um, extremes. Uh, and there might be other reasons that uh, like uh, models uh, uh, fidelity like uh, uh, systematic errors. There are some limitations here. So we could explore more than how we can improve the prediction of extremes for either from improved model or improve the, our understanding of the predictability source. Thanks very much, Li Wei. Um, Folks, if you have any questions at all, please do enter them. Um, Li Wei, is there anything that you would like to add to your presentation? Um, you know, for somebody like myself who is not a climate modeler, mm -hmm. I'm always curious about like how how this translates into uh, how it can affect a regular person. So, to me, what I'm understanding is that people seasonal prediction is so far out that this model has really improved things. So we can really get a good idea of what's coming down the road in terms of it. And I could see how this would be critically important for say farmers. Um, is there, is, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, actually the one of the motivation of this study on um, seasonal extreme prediction is because it's so much important for multiple sectors, including like uh, agriculture or resource management, and also important for decision makers because of time scale. So that's why we focus on the, the seasonal scale. Yeah, one of the uh, implication we want to emphasize is that we, uh, by knowing the most predictable modes of the extremes, we can improve our uh, predictions. It, it can be think as a, a post process of our raw seasonal hand cast. Then we make a, a further step to make an improved forecast that can be beneficial for uh, multiple sectors. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your time and um, thank you to everyone for coming to the uh, UCAR CPAS Discovery Seminar. And I'd like to remind you all that you can go to our website and find out about future talks at cpass.ucar.edu. And you will also be able to find a link to this talk um, shortly on that website once it's uploaded to YouTube. Uh, Li Wei, our sincere thanks to you for sharing this important Thank research you. with us. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you, for your support. <laughs> Um, it's wonderful. It's, it's wonderful all the work that you and your colleagues are doing. Um, we'd also like to thank Brett Batterman of UCAR Multimedia Services for his invaluable assistance to uh, this broadcast and all of them. And um, we hope to see everyone on November 23rd for our next CPAS discovery. And um, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.